Welcome to the Turning Stone Show, where we discuss topics of the human experience. We're here to offer conversation, ask questions, and explore. We invite you to join us on this journey in the discovery of purpose in life. I'm David Marsh, and here with me, as always, is Jesse Farrell and Justin Maman. Today's conversation is called Behind the Curtain, Connecting with Unseen Energy. We're joined today with special guest, Trev Reinhardt. He's a military veteran, a former sniper in Afghanistan, and currently he's in the school of the Southwest Institute of Healing Arts studying energy modalities. He's also a near-death experiencer. Recently, we spent some time with Trev, and I'd like you to hear his story. So in November of 2012, I was uh, coming home down a little back alley street in Michigan, and uh, Deer jumped out right in front of my truck, swerved to miss it. Because ironically, I didn't want to hit the deer or mess up the truck. And what ensued was rolling my truck three to five times. I uh, don't really remember much past uh, the third roll where a fire hydrant came in the driver's side window. And with a big smile on my face thinking, well, I'm going home. I got literally ripped out of my body uh, and thrust into an indescribable being of just fully connected and not an idea you can say unconditional love and union with all of existence but to actually feel viscerally through your entire being and no longer having a human body but to feel in every ounce and depth and knowing within your soul that is the place that I went to and I was so unbelievably connected and happy and after that, uh, I got turned around and I got stuck back in, in my suit, my human suit. There was a, an awkward sensation that kind of came along with it. My whole body felt cold and stiff and rigid. Outside of my truck on the other side of the street was in a little old woman and she was just staring at me. So I walked across the street and I was exhausted. So I squatted down and she ran over, rushed over and wrapped her arms around me. The next day informed me that uh, she was a nurse for over 45 years and I was dead. She's seen dead people that I walked across the street like a zombie covered in blood and just squatted down. I was ice cold, had no pulse, wasn't breathing, and I was just sitting there staring for like 13 minutes. And then all of a sudden started breathing, my pulse came back, my body warmed up. I got hit with a startling fact that my entire concept and idea of reality was shattered. And here I was, back into a a freshly minted body with one little scratch on my knuckle and I had lost somewhere they said around like two or three liters of blood. So now I find myself wandering from place to place assisting those who need healing and directing wayward energy to its rightful place as well as being able to sit with the earth who's probably one of the more wounded of all of us and give back some of that nurturing love that every being who rests on her unconditionally gets from the air you breathe to having a footing underneath you. It's not constantly trying to destroy you. What stands out to me when I listen to that is where were you before your incident and where are you now? Kind of, kind of talk through that. I knew I was off my path. I was in a uh, real bad space. Um, living in the uh, very negative end of the spectrum of life. And I had this crazy feeling that's come up a few times right before I make a spontaneous decision or travel someplace far in the world. And um, I didn't, I just ignored it for like a week or two. And then car accident happened. All of the anger that I felt, a lot of hatred towards myself, it was gone. Um, and it was replaced with a curious sense of wonder because everything I was angry about, everything I hated, I realized was very superficial. 
and it was contained in a perspective that was very limited. And as soon as that got opened up, um, mm. I realized just how big the world is. Can you expand a little bit more on, on what exactly were you doing prior to the accident? What was life like? What was kind of a day-to-day -day in the life of Trev? What was, what was happening? Um, so I was drinking a lot. I was getting drunk uh, probably most nights. And that was just trying to numb and suppress everything that I was feeling. What were you numbing and suppressing? A lot of, again, anger, hatred towards myself, and just not wanting to be here anymore. Was that re related to military duty at all? Anything there? It was, uh, this was going on before I ever joined the Marines. Um, when I joined the Marines, my whole uh, idea was to die in combat. And when that didn't happen, I had to come back and try to figure out a life on top of everything that I learned and took away from the Marines, which made it even more of an interesting experience. For fun, me and my friends would go out to bars and again drink and try to find uh, one of the bigger Southerners in the area and see if he would take a swing at a little cute sniper. So, so what do you mean by you, I mean, did you consciously, was that your choice as far as going into the Marines specifically, like that was, you knew that was going to happen as far as go in, you were going to serve, lose your life, and that would be it, like that was your intention for going in, or? I think that was more of like my fantasy. Um, Die a hero. Or just leave, but leave. Um, yeah. have it not be a... Uh, have someone actually take my life. Like, that's something I couldn't just give away yeah. or hand to somebody. Yeah. But um, if they were able and willing to take it, then by all means. Did you feel like, did you feel like that whole time, like, you had a deeper sense of purpose through that time period? And that kind of, you know, it sounds like there's maybe some suicidal stuff going on there and, and you wanted to just die in combat rather than, you know, you wanted to have it be part of your life experience almost. Yeah. But did underneath all that, did you still, did you still feel like you had a sense of purpose in being here? Oh, I did. Um, I didn't realize or fathom what that purpose was because the path I'm walking now, if um, I had you know, <laughs> even sent a video recording to myself or wrote myself a letter, uh, I would have laughed. Yeah. And so then how old were you uh, when you came back from the Marines? And then how old were you at the time of the accident? 22 when I got out of the Marines. Okay. You're and young. the accident happened probably right after my 23rd birthday. Oh, wow. Okay. And then how old are you now? I'm 26. So 26. So I've been yeah. a few years. Yeah. So take us through where you were as you were taken out of your body. Uh, in the piece we saw, you were ripped out of your body. Take us through that level of consciousness that you experienced and you attained? Um, it was it's indescri indescribable. Language is hard it to is. use to um, describe that. I, I, yeah. One, you don't have eyes in the conventional sense. So you uh, see more of the, or experience more of the uh, energetic aspect behind life. So all the little moving mechanical pieces um, that I mean, might be on the atomic level. I mean, the human eye perceives 1% of the known light spectrum. And when you're in that space, you're in the full light spectrum. There's also that overwhelming sense that you are connected and you can feel that through everything, um, which is really probably one of the more magical experiences, I mean. You can see how there's differences between, you know, what we call light and dark. But to feel the purpose, the need, and the reason for everything is a trip. And to pose a question, you couldn't hate something if you didn't really love it. So otherwise you just genuinely wouldn't care. It sounds like there's a level of intuition there. It sounds like you became, like, hypersensitive to sort of that full spectrum that you talk about. Oh, yeah. So did you, were you pretty sensitive? Do you remember being really sensitive growing up? Like were you always a pretty sensitive child um, to the energy around you? And then do you think that's part of what was being suppressed? I was. I was very sensitive when I was very young. 
I even had glimpses and memories of uh, my previous time here on Earth. And then I shut that off when I was really young because I wasn't allowed to uh, experience what I was trying to experience that was reserved mm -hmm. for you know, people in the negative end of the spectrum. Right. Um, so that was part of what uh, kind of led me on the path to the Marines was yeah. shutting off and shutting down a huge piece of myself, being unable to connect to that energy. Yeah. And then diving so far in that, you know, negative end of the spectrum that the only reasonable course of action would be for me to die and then yeah. enjoy life from a more neutral to uh, positive. Sure. Yeah. Exploration. What was the, can you say some more about like the experience, you talked about being connected to all. And I think that oftentimes we take for granted for how connected we actually are to each other as well as to all. So can you say a little bit more about what was that, what was that experience? Like what was, can you expand on that a little bit? The best way I could probably describe it is through a metaphor. Like we're in a story mm -hmm. and you know, who's the, as humans, we love a good story. You know, the components of a story, they have, you know, unlikely heroes, they have a hyper powerful villain. There's always love and there's a lot of chaos. So getting a glimpse and a view of the story in its whole, knowing a piece of your part and then coming back. We, in most stories, there's, you know, in that chaotic moment, nobody knows what's going to be happening in the future. Otherwise, there would be little point to it. Mm -hmm. um, getting to actually feel and see that, hey, we're in a story. Yeah. Like we think we're the master storytellers, but there's uh, an intelligence behind the universe that's put all of life into existence and into play. So that's the greatest storyteller of all time. Yeah. So to get a little bit of that separation, to know that, you know, this isn't as serious as we might like to think it is. We all have a very important piece to play, and we all have to play our part. And I think one of the bigger gifts from having that was having that experience and that sense of knowing, and then having a piece of it taken away. Yeah. Because I can't predict all of the future or my destiny or others, right. because then I'm going to get really lax. I'll get complacent. Right. And so, yeah, so that, that brings up, so when I watched your video, I had lots of questions. I, I like to think in concepts. And so I think of concepts like um, choice and destiny, right? So when you have this bigger picture perspective, you know, a, a big mantra of our modern day is that is empowerment and, and choice and that we have choice points in our lives to basically influence our own outcomes to create our own experiences. So when you get this bigger picture perspective and you see that, you know, basically there's something larger going on and we're playing parts in it, we're kind of playing roles in a story. Mm -hmm. So where does, where does choice and free will, how does that play into like destiny and that bigger picture? So we're all made of the same intelligence. There's just a slight distinction between, you know, the energy of my soul and your soul. They're like two peaks of the same, you know, ocean. Spectrum, yeah. So, you know, I might be the peak of one wave, you're the peak of another, as are you two, but we're all made of the same water. An evolution of your soul, you're going to be making decisions that is, you know, best for the learning of you as your own sovereign being and identity. That is to say, we're still made from this same composite yeah. whole. Yeah. And that same composite whole has a little more understanding of the way things are going. Yeah. So you have the freedom to make, you know, your choices and your decisions yeah. as they are brought into, you know, your human awareness. Yeah. And I think the difference is we're all going towards something. Yeah. And whatever you need to learn to appreciate the direction you're going in mm -hmm. or the need for it, mm -hmm. you're going to make all those decisions and you might learn things the easy way through observation yeah. or occasionally yeah. like me, you're going to learn things the hard way. So mm -hmm. those lessons really get hammered home and you don't find yourself screwing up 
when you do need to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah it, it, for me, it's far more than occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My question to that, though, is, is like, so yesterday I, uh, I was out to lunch, and well, I was going to lunch, and I wanted to have lunch with a stranger, someone I'd never met, like just to kind of expand my capability of being able to walk up to a stranger and have lunch. Uh, as I, so I, I picked a restaurant that I was going to go to, and I was just sitting outside waiting. And as I was sitting there, I thought, okay, rather than me like just trying to pick out the best person for me to have lunch with, like I put it out there just as a, as a prayer to the universe. It's like, okay, send me the perfect person that you would have me to have lunch with, which would be my normal thought pattern. And as I was sitting there about 15 minutes, I got up and walked around because nobody was walking by or there were couples and I just wanted to have lunch with one person. When I went back and sat down, I had a different thought. And the thought was, you already knew I was going to be here at this restaurant asking this question and already have what person I'm going to have lunch with. So how much do you think life is already pre-set up and then we're just you know, cr cranking along, like if you could look at the perfection of all, like your accident was actually designed, you designed your accident as part of your evolution, like you created that as part of your story and experience, and here is the result of that. So how much would you say, based on your experience now working with energy and uh, destiny, is how much of our lives are actually set up already and now we're actually just kind of playing the game? From a higher intelligence, I'm pretty convinced it's all of it. Yeah. That's the paradox. I mean, that's the paradox is that we're here, we're all sitting here with our own personal identities referring to ourselves as I. Each of our own perspectives seem whole to us, but they're partial in the greater context of everything. And yet, because they're partial, we can never fully access that perspective as human beings we have to follow our own paths. Well, what was interesting about that then is then if we could really look at the wholeness of it all, how much would that, I mean, there's, it goes, I'm reminded of the saying is like, don't sweat the small stuff. It's like, seriously, yeah. it's all like already there. If we could well, actually get into the, the perfection stuff, of it all, and there, there's no good or bad, small or big, whatever, yeah. it's just what is. And if we could get into the, perf that everything is in its perfection of timing, and then learn to trust and surrender, like how differently our lives would be, rather than being in resistance by so much all the time of everything going on. And we have it like, there was something wrong with having the accident, or we were in the wrong place at the sure. right time, or if I would not done that or not done that, and, and really rather than just accepting that, okay, this is part of my journey, and then also giving that as a gift to others, like everything that we experience is part of our journey, rather than being in resistance, there is something wrong with what is happening. Is that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm the one who adds the beautiful comments. To this. <laughs> Justin's the insightful one, and Dave's the you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for picking up on that very quickly. You got it. Um, life is so expansive; it needs everything in it to give it its depth and context. I mean, from the way I perceive the world to the way you perceive the world to how the way every dog and bug on this mm -hmm. planet perceives the world around it. I mean, that is what makes up the definition of all existence, yes. and that's just on this world. I mean, plants, they can tell when they're being cut, they can tell when they're mm -hmm. being eaten, they respond to music and to, you know, uh, energy in the environment. If you're really angry and you're around plants, I mean, they will feel it. Your water will change if you're in a horrible mood and you're angry. They've tested water molecules yeah. and they alter. If you're in a loving, happy space, it affects the environment around you. One of the things that first attracted um, me to meeting you is kind of this connection between all and this like what is actually like if we're all here on this earth school and we're experiencing certain things. And so a thought that I've always had in my head is I lost my brother in 1995 from a car accident. He slid on black eyes, was hit by a car. And when I saw you, I don't know if you remember, but I came up to you, I'm like, what was the first question I asked you was, when's your birthday? Because I wanted to know exactly how old you were. Mm -hmm. I've had this thought that I would be traveling along Earth, and at some point, I will meet my brother again, and I will know energetically that I have met my brother again. And you're the closest to that that I've ever actually experienced. I don't know exactly how that works, I've just had this thought. 
And how I've described you to people is like you're the same bone structure as my brother. Your eyes are the same, like piercing blue eyes. The hair is exactly the same as I remember my brother, like the height and everything. Like you are a replica of my brother, John. And so there was just this instant connection of what if, like what, what, what if, like we lost someone and then we experience in our lifetime again, being able to experience that relationship at a whole different level, um, still in the same lifetime. I think that is entirely possible. I have heard of people's uh, parents reincarnating as their children. And then having the awareness and the experience that was actually that was their relationship prior. The child knows it. The child usually. Knows it. You know, I was going to ask you earlier. Um, do you identify yourself like as uh, a medium or as a clairvoyant, as part of this experience or as a as a result of this experience or a title that I've kind of I like and that some friends have given me is um, like a modern day shaman. Yeah. Um, most of them would go through a. A near-death experience. Um, sometimes it was uh, facilitated for them, but when that happens, your energetic structure changes. Yeah. Your uh, crown chakra, which is used to modulate how much energy comes in and out of you, yeah. blows wide open, yeah. so that your, all of your energy and your soul can leave. Yeah. Um, when you get shoved back into your body, that sphincter state or that you know chakra stays Contract. blown wide open. Oh, oh, got it. So then the amount of energy that you perceive is always going to be different. The way that you feel and interact with energy is going to be different. Do you feel that um, children in particular have a more open, more, I guess, naturally kind of a more open, um, an openness to energy, to the energy around them? And do you think that like over time that contracts and then like experience like peak state experiences like that kind of open us back up to it absolutely a lot of children that you know my friends children they are wildly perceptive they feel energy probably better than I could yeah and I mean I remember being that way when I was younger and yeah. the big shift is when uh, they get told that you're not allowed to feel that way mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. most right. of us yeah. as we get older uh, typically don't feel or have a relationship with the unseen. Well, it's not, ra it's, it's not a rational thought process. The reason I think about this is Ken Wilber's uh, theory is that we come into the world as human beings fused, like fused with all of existence, kind of like that oneness. And then our growth process is a differentiation process where we basically differentiate between self and other and we become more rational in our thought process. And then there's an integration period that takes place, you know, after the differentiation process. Do you feel like that is what needs to happen in a sense? Like where children are said, all right, well, hey, like we can't be off in this perceptive fantasy land. Like there's a practical reality that we need to differentiate and be in and then kind of integrate our sensitivity to the unseen, like, do you think that that process needs to happen in that in that sequence? So, I, do you get what I'm asking? I get what you're saying. Okay. Kind of kind of ground it, like, get grounded first in being human here, and then reconnect to the unseen. To have a clear understanding of uh, what you don't want or what doesn't work, you have to have an experience with it. Yeah. Being told that you know that unseen doesn't exist or is a fantasy land, is. Uh, I think what shuts it off. Yeah. I mean, if they show most children, if they're allowed to behave only a certain way at home, and then they get yelled at if they behave any other way, and yeah. then they go to school and they get yelled at for behaving the way they would at home, that child becomes almost like a schizophrenic. Yeah. They have to adopt two entirely different personalities just to fit in to their world around them. So yeah. taking any division within the self is I think going to be maybe a little uh, detrimental of a lesson, but an important lesson nonetheless. Yeah. If, uh, I mean, the children are supported in what they see and feel. So Trev, you shared with us how you have been able to feel energy, you've actually been able to harness low level energy that some would term maybe negative energy. You have a big calling. You shared with us about your goal of going to Germany and somehow being an intermediary for 
energy that's trapped or somehow in that region. Tell us about what your project is coming up, where you're going to be at, that process. Because what we want to do is we want to come back in another episode and kind of hear what happened when you went over there. So kind of give, uh, give the viewers a little bit of understanding of where you're at with that. Absolutely. Uh, it got brought into my awareness um, through a mutual friend who owns many resorts in Bad Solza, Germany. Um, that there is a site there that people have been coming in to attempt to clear or do something with. Um, that was the site where the Nazi high command used to actually go and gather to relax and enjoy downtime. And spawned the uh, first idea about could they get away with a genocide? Could they get away with rounding up a bunch of people to a small location and killing them? And when they found out, yes, we can get away with this, they uh, made plans to do that on a much larger scale. So typically when uh, a lot of human life is removed from this world in a state of hate, fear, or anger, um, confusion, that energy lingers. It's uh, more difficult for it to <laughs> accept and transition into the next phase of its journey and uh, it sits around being pissed off, frustrated, and typically wanting revenge or to make sure that nothing else happens like that again. So when uh, I heard that you know, people have been coming to this place for probably like 50 years trying to do something with it and everybody's been turned away by the energy there, um, something tingled in my spine and I knew it was right up my alley. Do I know exactly what I'm doing uh, when I get over there? Not really. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I'm going to be doing is uh, a ceremony with the land and the energy there to familiarize myself with it. It's uh, my genetic land and my genetic heritage. So I am sure I have friends and family over there that I can tap into. Um, but before I even go anywhere near one of uh, that land's biggest wounds, I'm going to familiarize myself, pay my respects, and uh, I think one of the big pieces is I'm going to go there and I'm going to listen to that energy, listen to those spirits and see what's been going on um, and see what, uh, what I need to do to help transition. That being said, I have a lot of friends and a lot of resources uh, from the other side. So I feel safer than I think most would. Do you feel like there's an energy that is going to present itself as an opposition to you? I feel like there's an energy that might try. Mm -hmm. Just because otherwise there would be way too easy. Yeah. Um, just to step into a place <clears throat> like that and have it shift like that, which could happen. Um, but you know, you prepare for the worst and you hope for the best. Show me the uh, the weapon, if you will, that you plan on using. I'd like to see that. Uh, so it's called a purba, or in Sanskrit, it's a kila, and it's a uh, Tibetan spirit knife. They uh, take the energy from the three different worlds through the blade, and bring that. This is the uh, business end, so the energy or negative energy would get ensnared by the totality of the blade. And then um, when it gets put into the earth, that energy that's trapped onto it gets forced into a transitionary state. So while most energy can't be killed or destroyed, it can be transitioned, it can be shifted and sent away from um, the earth plane. Can you elaborate on the three worlds? So you have the higher world, um, our world, and then a very low vibrational existence. So this would work between any of those and with a totality of all three. It's also a positive, negative, and neutral pole. Are you uh, working with a team, like a physical team, like in this reality team, other than the, you, you mentioned that you have a team of people that you're working with on the other side. Are you going alone at this? Can you say about like, how are you going about this and what else are you doing? Um, I'm largely, I believe I'm going to be alone. I do have many friends here who, you know, are human and 
actually do similar type work. However, I feel like most of my resources uh, will be drawn from beings and entities that uh, I've met and befriended outside of my body. Do you have you like explored this work within the context of Suiha? I have actually. For for the audience, we mentioned earlier that Suiha is a Southwest Institute for Healing Arts. That's that's where Trevor is pursuing his education, energy work. So that's. That's the acronym, is SWEHA. I have a friend over there who uh, has two children, and there was something living in her house. Her children wouldn't be more than five feet away from her at any time. They wouldn't go to the bathroom by themselves. They wouldn't take a shower by themselves. Um, and they were afraid to go to sleep. My friend brought and in, invited over many people to come clear and do something with the house. Um, and all that seemed to happen was it it pissed off that energy to the point where those people who are coming in to offer to clear the house, um, like, we can help you move. So at that point is when it got brought into my awareness. After entering the house, I burned some copal, which is a very powerful fossilized resin, just for their comfort. And then I went to the epicenter where the creature was and addressed it. And within probably about 10, 15 minutes, it had agreed to leave their house and come with me to be transitioned to the other side. So can you can you kind of um, walk us through how that process works? Because obviously from a human perspective, I'm imagining you having just like a conversation like, hey dude, can you really just leave his family alone? You know, like, mm -hmm. so how does that, how does that process really happen? It begins with meditating, getting to a very clear state. Um, setting up, I don't want to say like a containment perimeter, but just a way so that the energetic structure of the building is slightly different, more geared towards my uh, safety and benefit. So how do you do that? Um, with energetic symbols. Okay. And uh, blessing of different types of water or herbal extractions. Got it. So kind of like ceremony or ritual? Very much so. Okay. And it sounds like a lot of things that are from the earth. Yes. Yeah. The first real big piece is addressing it. Acknowledgement. I mean, yeah, just pretending that it's you know not there isn't going to get anything done. No. Um, demonizing it isn't going to get anything done. Mm -hmm. But to uh, talk to it like I would, you know, any of you, is essential because then it you're recognizing that energy. Yeah. Sure. And that energy knows what you are. Yeah. It knows and it knows that it has a limited amount of options when you address it from that space. Sure. If you're afraid of it, it will feed off of that fear. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you realize that, hey, I am much more powerful than I've ever been led to believe. Do and you ever get nervous or worried or scared when you're doing Things like this? Depends on the amount of energy that's there. If it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, um, typically no. But if um, it's me in a room full of uh, really mm. negative energy, of course that, you know, that fear sensation comes up. And I think what I've learned over the past couple of years is fear is the energy that your body is generating to overcome whatever obstacle mm is in front of you. You can choose to harness that energy or be crippled by it. Yeah, we've yeah. talked a lot about that. David. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice for someone who has a, a negative energy, maybe in a dwelling or where they're at? Is there anything that they can do to uh, put themselves in a position of calm and have that peace restored? Or do they need to call someone like yourself to assist them in that? It would depend on how sensitive to energy they are and how comfortable they are in working or addressing something that you know, the human eye can't necessarily perceive. And it would depend on the energy. If that energy is getting violent, um, I would call someone. You'd be surprised at how many people um, do this type of work. Yeah. Um, and you're going to want you know, some type of burning and like sage it works, but depending on the energy, you would use something like copal or frankincense. 
And that's just because it's going to make the environment toxic for a negative uh, energetic being. Mm. And then when it's in that toxic state, it's either going to hide, it's going to leave the area, or you can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with it while you feel safe. So, I mean, a lot of this sounds like it's really just um, kind of an extension of human beings relating to, like I can, I'm, I'm a psychology major, I could see that as just being almost like how we approach therapy is, you know, you, people, people need to be acknowledged first um, and a lot of times to work through our difficult challenges we have to demonizing them doesn't work um, suppressing them doesn't work so we almost have to like acknowledge they're there and um, allow them to process so it's kind of similar I see like a parallel and almost like how how we relate with one another absolutely yeah honoring its existence and the funny piece of it is um, I have actually called on some of the entities that I have shifted out of this world mm. and they have come back and done wonderful wonderful deeds for the right people and then mm. they graciously yeah. transition back to the other side again. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors so when I heard about your story um, it was very personal to me. Uh, I've spent the last few years really feeling into how that trauma that they experienced, you know, 70 years ago is still impacting my family today. I get this sense on a regular basis now that a lot of my own habit patterns in relationship and in my life experience are almost still like linked to that trauma. What do you know about the Holocaust um, in terms of the story, the history of it, um, that that might help you in in your journey now going to heal that energy there? Uh, now I know that even most young Germans uh, feel a sense of shame and guilt about what happened, you know, yeah. even though it was before they were ever born. Um, so there's a deep lingering that something very wrong happened there. Something that us as a human species, you know, needed to experience to realize, wow, we can can never do this to one another again. Yeah. And as long as there is a pattern of habit of that something like this is okay based on someone's skin color, um, race, ethnicity, uh, religion, that energy is going to be screaming, no. We are way too linked and connected mm. to allow mm -hmm. this to happen again. Um, so where we think war is an answer to a lot of things, maybe going back and healing from some of these places where this devastation has occurred is mm. more the answer. If we can heal the earth, uh, recognize energy that you know is still here, I've been to Auschwitz before. If you go there, you can feel it. Yeah, There's a heaviness there. And people go and feel the heaviness. But to go and you know address that energy and be like, what happened here was wrong. Yeah, And those of you who are stuck here, now you have an option. You can stay here and be stuck. Or you can transition and enjoy the next part of your life knowing that what's happened here we're working on it. We are going to transition, you know, not only, and that's, I think the big part that I'm really excited for is going to this space is like knocking over that first big domino. Mm. <sighs> that's exactly what I say too. Yeah. It's funny. When yeah. you say so that. what do you, what do you recommend or what do you suggest to say, like in, in the case of my grandparents, I still feel like there's just so much resentment there and I feel like I mean they're obviously really old now they're in their 80s they're both still alive um, but I feel like some of that trauma is just like not it's not it's not transmuting it's not going anywhere it's just right. like and not really even that it's designed to in this lifetime that was right. part of their experience and it changes over over time yeah I I, I just I'm just curious like what you're here, aren't you? Mm-hmm. 
the yeah. circumstances that brought you here are a direct result of what happened to them. Right. So there is a perfection in, you know, yeah. their suffering and the experience that they went through. And if that's the only reason why they were here, to bring you, to share yourself with the world, but we to, all have our purpose. To all show, show the strength that, you know, the survivors had. Mm -hmm. It was anything but easy yeah. or pleasant. Yet the strength of the human soul shows that people can survive that. And not only mm -hmm. survive that, you know, live a, an amazing life, yeah. continue to, you know, love their children. If we can learn and really show how to forgive, not, you know, because mm -hmm. what they did is acceptable. It, yeah. You know, that was anything but acceptable. But when you forgive, it does something to yourself. You're no longer carrying that weight. You're no yeah. longer carrying that anger, that hatred around with you. Then you can go out and you can go and live in a much lighter and free way. Yeah. And I think that's a big piece of it. The Indians say, you know, when you do a strong piece of healing, it can go seven generations back and seven generations forward. Yeah, I like that. So awesome. we're at an opportunity now. I mean, or the world is the way it is. Like, if we were born into heaven, would we appreciate it? <laughs> Probably not. It's a great question. It's beautiful. That but wonderful. we're in a very beautiful point and turning point in human history where we have so many examples of what doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. 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 So great. Awesome. That's beautiful. Awesome. Trev, we thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, we're excited to hear the other half of this journey. We like to end each episode with a turning stone, something to set your intention for the week. And with today's turning stone, we turn to Jesse. The question to practice this week is what does your soul desire to experience in this moment, this moment, and in this moment of time that would have it be fulfilled? So one thing I was left with with today's episode is really thinking about the word that popped out to me the most was the word forgiveness. And just quickly, I remember an experience that I had recently where I was uh, doing an exercise to get to that point of forgiveness with both my dad and my stepdad. And when I finished that exercise, and I've done it many, many times before, and this time when I got to the point where I was forgiving, I realized suddenly forgiveness was no longer even necessary. Like I was in such a space with both of them that all that was present for me was love. And it was so visceral in every part of my body that all that was there was love and forgiveness wasn't even necessary. And so my challenge for you this week is to look at relationships that you have in your life where forgiveness where you could reach a deeper level of forgiveness, which would lead you to a deeper level of love, and just where there's nothing there actually to forgive except all you experience is love. And when we look at forgiveness, we actually really look at forgiveness for ourselves. It's not for the other person, it's not for the experience, it really is for ourselves, for again, that what, what does your soul want to experience? And your soul does desire to experience that wholeness of love. And so look this week in all your relationships, who can you experience forgiveness with and make it a great, awesome, amazing week. Remember, this is a show about questions and questioning. It is not a show about answers. Nothing we say is the truth. It is up to each of us to discover our own truth. Join us each week on The Turning Stone Show as we continue our journey of conversations. Subscribe and get in touch with us. Stay connected and join in the conversation. 